Um, thank you so much for coming uh, tonight um, to uh, our conversation with, with uh, uh, Mika. Um, just a couple of, uh, of housekeeping things before, before we uh, start. Um, uh, number one, of course, uh, Mika is a uh, presiding judge in the uh, Israeli Federal District Court, but she's not speaking here as a judge tonight. Um, so, uh, number two, which of course we all know is a in a common law system like, like Israel, like the United Kingdom, um, uh, judges are not seen as part of the machinery of the state. They are often seen as the means of holding the state uh, accountable, and I, I think that that's important. So, so we're going to talk tonight. Uh, uh, we're going to traverse, if you like, law and the conflict, um, but staying within the zone of of of, of law. Um, very much. So I'll just introduce uh, Mikhail first of all, but then I also wanted to say as we have this conversation, uh, the space for questions at the end, but I think, um, you know, we've got a nice small group here, which is lovely, there's space for questions in the middle. So I'll ask a question, Mikhail may respond, and, um, you know, maybe my follow-up question won't be good enough, and you just jump in and, and, and we can have a conversation together, because that's what tonight's uh, uh, about. So Dr. Mikhail Agmongonen uh, is, as I said, the presiding judge in the Israeli uh, Federal District Court in the Administrative uh, Appellate Division, so the Court of Appeal in, in Israel in relation to administrative law. Um, she is also an affiliate professor at, at Bookman University, Bookman School of Law at Tel Aviv University, and as you all know, uh, she is a visiting professor here at LSE Law School. Now, I'm a corporate lawyer, and in some respects, so is Mikhail, and that's how I got to know Mikhail as a corporate lawyer, uh, as a fiduciary lawyer. Uh, I'm a fiduciary lawyer. Uh, fiduciary law is about uh, 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 regulating power that you've given to someone to ensure that they, they exercise that power in, in the interest of the person who gave them that power, not in their own interest. Fiduciary law is other regarding law. And, and, and so Mikhail is a fiduciary lawyer, uh, but that other regarding component of what she's done is also really profoundly important. She's a, uh, uh, a minority rights lawyer. Uh, she's done a huge amount to protect Palestinian rights in Israel. And I just wanted to mention a couple of those things to contextualize uh, uh, Mikhail's uh, career. So for instance, uh, uh, she is well known in Israel for uh, enforcing planning law in Tel Aviv to prevent uh, the removal uh, of uh, uh, Palestinian homes uh, in, on the outskirts of uh, Tel Aviv. She's been at the forefront of protecting Ukrainian refugee rights in Israel. Uh, uh, and this is a Harris editorial from 2022, and I wanted to read this. I think it's important. Uh, in that editorial, talking about Mikhail, it said, she stands almost alone against the attitude of the state and the interior ministry. Agmon Golan has handed down a number of decisions that have defended the basic rights of the refugees arriving in Israel. She has prevented the deportation of those whose requests to remain in Israel were denied. She ordered the population authority to give refugees temporary work permits and required the state to allow them to remain in Israel for 48 hours to fully explore their legal options. And then most recently, in February of this year, uh, she's extremely well known in Israel uh, for a decision uh, uh, that um, held that a uh, Palestinian refugee from the West Bank uh, uh, would it be a refugee under the UN Refugee Convention uh, uh, when that person was being persecuted for his sexual orientation. Um, so an incredible track record in Israel of protecting uh, and minority rights. So before we get into the into the the substance of our conversation, Mikhail, maybe you want to say a little bit about how how you came to be the lawyer that, that you are. Okay, so first of all, thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you, David, for uh, inviting me to LSC. It's been uh, it's the second year, and it's been great to be here, and for the invitation for uh, today. Um, the reason for my talk here, and I'll tell you a little bit about my background, is that I really believe that um, human rights is the most important uh, field of law. I, when I wanted to, when I went to law school, I it was with a dream to promote human rights, and I hope I'm doing it uh, right now in, in my current uh, job. So my family history, in a nutshell, 
Uh, my mother, who is still with us, is a Holocaust survivor. She was two years old when the war started. She was living uh, in Belgrade, former Yugoslavia. And after the Nazis took her uh, father and brother, her mother hid her with friends in one of the villages, and she was there all alone, uh, like their uh, child, uh, from the age of two till the age of uh, five. Her mother and sister hid too and survived, came to Israel later, the whole um, family was uh, killed later. Um, from my father's side, his family came to Israel after the Jews, as Jews, were expelled from uh, Spain in 1492. Uh, 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 the family came to what is today Greece, Egypt, and Israel. They were uh, divided. And the family lived here uh, with the population in Israel, mostly our population. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather from my father's side lived in a, um, it was a village now, it's a part of Jerusalem uh, called Amutol. It's a mixed, uh, mixed neighborhood and my uh, grandmother was the midwife of the village. So uh, all along my, uh, um, my life, my childhood, I grew up uh, hearing about uh, how people should not be discriminated against uh, on any base, not religion, not race, gender, and so forth. And that you should always help the, those who are hurt and are discriminated against, those who are less fortunate. Just to uh, I'll tell you an anecdote, my mother was over 80. Um, she was, uh, um, four years ago, the government wanted to um, expel families of uh, foreign workers who extended their permits and had children in Israel. The children were uh, school age, they were born here, they were here till the age of nine or ten, and there were a lot of families like that. Uh, the government didn't do that, nothing for like nine or ten years. They went to school, so they knew they were there. And they arrested all of them, all the families. And there was a big outcry. And my mother told me, I'm going to hit those kids if they're going to be expelled. Because you know, people did that for me. I'm going to do it for them. Uh, there was the need to do that. The court prevented their expulsion at the end. But uh, this is my background. And this is how I uh, grew up. And, all along my career as a lecturer, when I write, uh, and of course in my uh, job, I think that's the most important thing, and um, that's how I Thank you. got there. <clears throat> Thank you. So, building out from that, from your, um, you know, your family history and your pathway then into being a, a, both a commercial judge, but also a judge focusing on, on protecting human rights, you protected the, you know, the rights of, 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 of refugees, uh, both Ukrainian refugees, but also now uh, Palestinians in the West Bank. You've um, <laughs> protected Palestinian Israelis um, in the of judgment. But I guess one of the things that people might ask, and I don't think people maybe understand, I'm not sure I do fully, so, and, but that reflects my ignorance, um, it would be interesting to talk about as well. If you've had scope to protect the rights of uh, Palestinians, in the West Bank in the context of the Refugee Convention. To what extent is there scope for judges to do more in Israel, to, uh, uh, to use uh, Israeli human rights protection to protect the rights of many of the, of the people who live in the West Bank whose rights aren't protected? Um, is there scope to do more for judges to do more? Um, not really. And the reason is uh, international law. The, the occupied territories are uh, um, the court uh, held that the occupied territories are occupied long ago. And uh, because of that, the rule of law there is the international So the courts uh, uh, do revise uh, the rights of uh, Palestinians, 
but according to international law, not the internal Israeli law. And, um, and they um, review the acts of the military regime, <coughs> which is still in the territories, uh, to the extent that it should follow the international law. For example, when they build a fence in Jerusalem, uh, the court uh, changed the, the places where the fence uh, was built, for example, not to divide the village into two, or not to divide, uh, or not to prevent people from going to, from their village to the places where they grew, for example, olives or things like that. Because international law uh, uh, protects their rights. That we cannot uh, use the internal Israeli law because then we're annexing the territories. When, when, was, that, when was that decision? Um, seven or eight years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's all along the way. Okay. That's the that's the main line, and I think it's the right line because then we keep it separate. Uh, the way I think it should be. Okay. So as I understand it, so if any other decision would be there to recognize an annexation, and it is not an annexation, it's an occupation, exactly. then then the rights that could be applicable to Palestinians are not then applicable. Is there pressure to, to, to rethink that as, 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 the, as the occupation goes on for so long that people remain uh, you know, unprotected, if you like, um, from, from those No, because the, the, the judgment, the decisions are very, are only along this line, and the courts wouldn't you know, take it any other way. And I think also the international community wouldn't mm -hmm wouldn't go this way. Mm, it's an interesting interaction isn't it, between international and domestic law. Mm. Okay, so we'll just maybe stay for a few minutes and we'll come back in a second to to the law that you know we we talked about the West Bank a little bit and so and obviously we've been talking a lot about this here in the past few weeks. There's been a, a, a you know conversation since we we said so since we invited Benny Morris and you know, everyone wants this to stop. Everyone wants it to be a ceasefire, and um, that, that's clear. If we can get to a ceasefire, then the question becomes, where do we go from here? And, and what scope is there for, for, for a solution? And we had Professor Morris speak to us a few weeks ago, and he was extremely negative about solutions. Students asking questions, I pushed in. It was a sense of real negativity about the possibility of, of finding a solution. You know, maybe lawyers can't, maybe judges can't protect the rights of people in, 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 in the West Bank, but can we then get to a space that would bring peace was the question we were asking. And I know you're not a lawyer, and I know you might, there's going to be limits to what you can say, but the question is, you know, to, to what extent can we find space for, for hope here, really, for reconciliation, for solution, for innovation? Corporate lawyer is a good innovation. We can come up with organizational structures that solve problems. You're a corporate lawyer for one minute, you're a human rights lawyer for the next. So, so what, what, what scope do you think there is, Mikhail, for finding some okay. hope there? So first of all, I want to emphasize that I'm not here on, um, as a judge. Uh, what I say is completely my personal views. And actually, I don't have any better uh, knowledge of the processes taking place uh, right now, other than reading uh, newspapers, as, as, uh, as you do. But um, I think, and that's why I, I, I accepted David's invitation to talk today, because I think the only way out of any problem uh, is by uh, talking about it and trying to uh, be innovative. Uh, as the saying goes, if there is a will, there is a way. And I hope there will be leaders on both sides that will be brave enough uh, to, to go forward. Um, I know the statistics of how many people uh, are for it and against it, but before the uh, peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, most Israelis were against it. So, and there were two brave leaders who went ahead and 
immediately after, most of the Israelis were for it, mm -hmm. and it holds up to today. So I think uh, I think we should be uh, we should be uh, hopeful. And um, uh, I want to quote um, Aliba Smith. She's an Irish academic and feminist that says, you have to think about the history and know that the whole world is a history of change and that in itself is hope. And another hope, and another quote that's by Sophie Walker, activist and political figure here in the UK. Uh, she wrote a book called Five Rules for Rebellion. And the first rule is defeat despair. And she wrote, and I quote, change requires a determination to step out of despair. And I think this is what we should do and believe and try. Everyone in his or her capacity uh, do the best and hope for the best. And you have to stay hopeful. I think despair is not an option. Yeah. I mean, it's got to, it's got to be right, right? And, and there's so many examples. I mean, come on. I hear this negativity, it's persuasive negativity, but we live in Europe, right? We've had peace in Europe for 80 years. You know, we have peace in Europe for 80 years because of institutional structures devised by constitutional corporate lawyers to, to solve problems, right? You know, we've, we've seen that in Europe, we've seen that in Ireland. There must be a pathway, but I think you have to be right. It's got to be about leadership, and it's interesting. Some of the conversations we've been having, right, um, over the past few few months. Prime Minister of Jordan was here, and one of the things he talked extensively was about the importance of leadership. The problem is, of course, we can talk about the importance of leadership, but do we have the leaders? And the answer, I think, we all feel is absolutely not. So, do you? Do you? I mean, obviously, in your position, you can't name names and critique particular government figures, but. Do you feel that, are you hopeful about the existence of leadership in, in Israel that can, can traverse our way through to peace? Right now, I think on both sides, we have very old leaders, not by age old, but by time in office old. And maybe, you know, for innovation, you need some uh, new figures. And I don't know, I hope they'll be. Uh, figures. Uh, right now there is a, uh, actually before the war began, uh, there were a, a very big demonstration in Israel and uh, there are leaders of this demonstration. I don't know if they'll go forward into politics, but it's interesting to see new figures in the public sphere. I, not in politics yet, but Okay. okay, great. Well, that, that, that's so figures in the judicial reform uh, debate and protest. So let's, let's, let's talk about that. So, so my first question to you is about why, why judges can't recognize rights of Palestinians in uh, the West Bank. And that's, that's, uh, that's really a question about why can't judges be more activist judges to solve political problems. And, and in a way, that's just a deeply naive question in Israel. Right, because in the past three years, uh, judges have been subject to attack by the Netanyahu <coughs> government, by uh, conservative and religious figures, and and that attack has come in the form of you know significant judicial reforms that have resulted in lots of people protesting those reforms and lots of judges and lawyers coming in against those reforms. So let's talk about a little bit of, a, a little bit about those reforms and how that might connect to Israeli society and then possibly to the conflict. Uh, but first of all, just so everyone's on the same page, can you tell us a little bit about those reforms and a little bit about why uh, uh, liberal uh, politicians and judges and lawyers were so vehemently opposed to those reforms? Okay, so on January 4th, of, uh, a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, uh, the new justice minister, just a week or two weeks after the government was uh, formed, um, announced on a press conference his plan for judicial reform that actually aimed to dramatically uh, reorganize the basic architecture of Israel democracy, of the law enforcement in general, not just judges, but also uh, the Attorney General Office and, um, and, and so forth. Uh, what he says in this uh, press conference, I translate it to English, 
people we didn't choose, the judges, decide for us. This is not democracy. That's what he said, and that's the base, and as he um, um, said it, for, for the reform. Now, before I go into a little bit of details about the reform, Israel, um, just to let everybody know, Israel doesn't have a constitution. It has uh, several basic laws that when the, when the country of Israel was established, it was uh, in the middle of a war, and they said, okay, we don't have time now to go and make a constitution, so we'll start with basic laws. So there is a basic law of parliament, of the judiciary, of the government, um, and uh, there is half of the human rights kind of chapter, <coughs> only few rights are protected, and there is no, and nothing about the legislation, the way we legislate, uh, basic laws, and uh, um, how uh, the judiciary can construct those laws, and, um, and so forth. And uh, that's, uh, and, and that's the structure that uh, the reform was, uh, was uh, done uh, against. So the first step was to forbid in a basic law, in a new basic law, or an amendment to a basic law that's similar to a constitutional amendment, actually, the use of the standard of extreme unreasonableness by the court. Um, you know this uh, um, uh, standard. It's it's it's, it's, it's uh, English law, <laughs> and uh, it allowed the courts to oversee government decisions where it's uh, disproportionately focused on political interests without sufficient consideration for public trust and its protection. And it was really used few times, not very much, few times. Um, for example, it was used to prevent the prime minister to uh, appoint politicians who are standing criminal procedures as ministers. I mean, really in extreme uh, circumstances. Um, so this was legislated and then struck down by the court. Other measures that were presented by the Minister of Justice, but not legislated yet in full. Some of them has went through the first reading in Parliament, and not the other two, so they are in all kind of stages. Uh, first of all is uh, to change the Judicial Selection Committee to become uh, more political. Right now, it's uh, uh, the Judges Selection Committee is composed of elected politicians, uh, uh, Supreme Court judges and uh, members of the bar. And selection of Supreme Court justice requires a majority of seven out of nine, so nobody can overrule the other. We need to get to some kind of uh, compromise. And so they wanted to change it and give the majority to politicians to appoint uh, judges to all, um, all courts, not only the Supreme Court. Um, another measure was the override clause that the, the parliament in a simple majority of 61 out of 120 can override any judgment of, of the court. The third measure was the transformation. This is very important and it's not so famous as the other uh, measures uh, of legal advisors and the attorney general into political appointees. Um, uh, right now, they're uh, appointed by a committee and are uh, serving as gatekeepers to ensure that the government complies with the law, so to prevent cases even coming before the court um, in advance. And he wanted to change it, and this law passed, but only one reading, so it's still um, there. And. Um, <coughs> And uh, just last January, a year later, and six months after the amendment was uh, enacted, the Supreme Court um, struck it down. Actually, a couple of questions before we get to the strike now. Yeah, so, of course. So I want to understand the visceral reaction uh, against these changes, these reforms. Um, and and you know, we, we, we obviously heard a lot about it on, on the news and we read about it and saw it on the television. But one of the 
things that always struck me when I listened to people explain what the changes were is, is how much like they seem to reverting to what the UK position is. So, for example, um, you know, if, if um, the, 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 any, any uh, uh, decision of the court could be changed by Parliament any time, by a majority in, in Parliament, if a court says that a, a piece of legislation is not compliant with the European Convention of Human Rights, Parliament can say, well, sorry, we, we, we're just going to do what we want to do. Now, when it comes to this idea of reasonableness, that's really interesting. Yako's written a lot about this in the context of proportionality. So uh, what's happened in Israel, I think what's happened in so many places, is that the development of judicial power to be able to say, um, we have the power to decide whether a particular action is proportionate. And we will look at the right that's interfered with, and we will look at the reasons that are given to interfere with it, and we'll decide whether it's acceptable. Right? Now, that's a development we've seen here in the UK, seen in many places. But in the late 1980s in the UK, the only thing that a court could ever do would be strike down a piece of legislation if it was seriously, seriously, sorry, not the legislation, strike down an executive action if it was seriously egregious which is when it's real reasonableness. So what struck me when I listened to this is, is, well, you know, are people going to go on the streets in the UK for these things? Oh, the Attorney General's also a political appointment here in the UK, right? So people are not on the streets right now. People wouldn't go on the streets if we went back to when reasonableness. So what is it? It's obviously something much more fundamental in terms of the structure of Israeli society that's driving it. So what is that? I think the problem is that those measures are actually meant to change the basic structure of democracy. It's not uh, the use in a certain case or a certain, uh, uh, for example, in those cases of the ministers that was, were struck down, they always uh, emphasize that. But it's really, if Striking this down, it's actually giving the majority the possibility to do everything they want. And this majority, they claim they can do whatever they want. So it's actually um, saying we, the majority right now is, um, is very conservative and very um, um, anti-part of human rights, not all, but some. So it's saying we can, we have 64, uh, a majority of 64, we can do whatever we want. And those measures are actually saying to the courts, we'll do whatever we want and you cannot stop us. So all the liberals were afraid that uh, they will do actually whatever they want and they will hurt their rights. So uh, I think this was the, it was really a uh, feeling that it's going to not be a full democracy anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's about protecting rights. So your own rights. Your own rights, but I'm just saying, so Moshe Cohen Iliad, I think he was here actually, he was visiting us last, Last, last term, and he has a different view of that. It's not about protecting rights, it's about protecting power. Mm -hmm. So it's about, it's about liberal elites in Israel saying, look, we've lost control of the Knesset, but we're not losing control of the courts. Um, do you think there's something in that or not? I don't think so. You know, the court right now, and even before the two last judges that we tried, uh, is, <coughs> is not very, it, it, I think all the judges are liberal in a way, but it's not like right wing, left wing. So it's, it doesn't mm -hmm. go to any other uh, side. And I don't think it's the reason. I think because the people who went to the streets were not only elites. That's the interesting thing. Mm -hmm. Millions went, hundreds of thousands of people. If it were only elites, it wouldn't get to those numbers. So I think it was really a feeling. And the laws that started to pass were in this direction. So there were really a feeling that, and, and there were a lot of right uh, side 
right wing uh, people demonstrating. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't the one side thing. Mm -hmm. One side would never get to those numbers. He's too simplistic. We've got to get Moshe back in time. He's too simplistic. <laughs> we're getting right soon. So, so I'm, I'm running out of time here. I want to give space. So just a, so can you just tell us a little bit? I've got a little bit about the decision, the Supreme Court decision that struck down the, the, the change in the basic law that would have changed the reasonable standard. Yes, I, I'll say it in a, really in the headline. The decision actually says um, two things. First of all, Parliament, you can do whatever you want. There are basic uh, rules that you cannot overturn, and there are basic, basic of democracy that you cannot step on. And the second thing, the court says, we need to finish the Constitution. We need to uh, either enact a, um, a basic law of legislation to, to set the, the rules, the ground rules. But it actually said, and the decision had uh, two, um, two parts. The first part, if the court can't strike down a basic law, uh, a constitutional amendment. And here the majority of the court, uh, um, and the whole court said, because it was so important, uh, the court said, in Israel they don't sit in a full panel. Oh, never. It was the first part. And uh, 12 out of 15 judges said yes. The, the, can, uh, the court can strike down the basic law in, in very uh, specific circumstances, but it can. There was a, uh, the other part was if the court can do it, should it do it in this case? Here the majority was smaller, eight to seven, but the main thing was telling the parliament, which is controlled by the government, you can do whatever you want. You have a majority, that's fine. But there are some basic democratic rules that are still there, and when you, uh, when you want to actually take all the powers without any checks and balances, <coughs> right now the court is the only one, you cannot do that. So that was the part of the decision. Right. Also, it's 700 pages, no. so. <laughs> But at the heart of it seems to be the identification of a legal idea which is that a central constitutional principle, fundamental constitutional principle, is the idea of a, a democratic Israel. And that this, um, this piece of legislation that interfered with, with the power of the judiciary interfered with that fundamental constitutional principle. I'm just going to push you a little bit on this again, if I may, um, and then I need to stop asking questions. I have questions on the ICJ judgment, etc., as well, but I'm not going to go there. We'll let everyone else ask on that. But it's just reverting to the point I made earlier about the ability of judges to be activists and to protect rights. And so here we have a fundamental constitutional principle. And I want to get the sense of this disconnection, this fundamental constitutional principle of uh, uh, Israeli democracy. We can do so much with these fundamental constitutional principles. So on the one hand, you have this driving idea. On the other hand, of course, you have a situation in the West Bank where so many millions of people are completely disenfranchised. Isn't there some scope for a court, an activist court, to thread the needle between occupation and annexation with the principle of, 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 of democratic Israel to realize that there has to be something else there that can protect the rights of these people? So you might put it in this very simplistic way, right? When we think about the profound change in the United States that occurred in, in, in the 20th century, one of the profound moments, and of course it was just a moment, but it really animated that moment, was Brown versus Board of Education. It was a Supreme Court judgment that profoundly changed the landscape. Is there scope for, for is there any scope, or is it just completely hopeless? I'm just being, probably being deeply naive to suggest that there could be a, a similar sort of move, a threading of the needle, using this constitutional principle. I think, I don't think it's, it's in this situation, it's the role of the courts to do it because the, the conflict is very, very, very complicated. And it's not only human rights, it's, it's much more complicated and it involves much, a much bigger picture, which the court is not uh, the right um, 
um, body of government to, to, to do it. And I think that great social uh, movements, or moves actually, um, need to come together from the courts and from within. There is a very interesting story about Switzerland with gay marriage. Uh, the courts announced that according to equality, uh, gay marriage should be allowed. But the society at that point wasn't ready for it, so it didn't go through. They stalled it in so many ways. And a few years later, 10 years later, it passed as a law very easily. So I think the courts can do things, and you gave one example, there are others. Internally, it's much easier. I think in this space of international law and, and international very complicated conflict, it's not the role of the judiciary to do it. The judiciary can't get too far ahead, and it risks the image of rising itself if it does. Thank you, Mikhail. Now, as I said, I have a bunch of other questions, but <laughs> we're, talking, we're, we're, we're not moving ahead quite at the pace I thought we might. So, so I can come back if I have the time. Um, colleagues, do you, do you have any questions that you want to, to ask them? Uh, I have a question. Would, how, would you talk about how like, Justice Barak's constitutional revolution in Israel led to the movement of quality of government case and how? It cemented a role in Israel of judges as guardians of the rule of law, because judges are the only check on the government's power now, and that's that principle is basically. It, would you say that principle has been established, and judges are the guardians of the rule of law in Israel now, with the basic, um, with the recent the movement for quality government case. I think that uh, it's not. First of all, it's um, it's not only uh, Barack's uh, decision, it was a majority of the court. Actually, the main judgment was written by Shamga, not by Barack, although he gets all the fire. <laughs> uh, but the Knesset enacted the basic law of, uh, of some of the human rights. And it didn't say uh, explicitly that the courts have the role of judicial review, but it did say that it should be checked that those rights are being held and there is no other uh, body of government that can do that. And I think the courts, um, activists or less activists, but held us and, and there were so little uh, laws that were struck down. I mean, uh, it sounds like the court uh, every day is striking down laws. And they strike down so little, uh, much less than other countries. For example, Canada, less than 5%, I think, of what they strike down. So uh, it wasn't so much. It was more the rhetoric than the actual doing. And uh, I think it's very, that's why we need the basic law of legislation that will say, okay, you enact a, a, a basic law in a bigger majority, like a constitution. Right now you can, act, uh, you can enact a basic law by a majority of three to two members of parliament, which is ridiculous. And, and then when can a court strike down in what, uh, if you need the whole panel of the judges or not, the Supreme Court only, and so forth. And then the override, when the Knesset can override uh, judgments and in what uh, majority. If it's a simple majority, again, it's not really uh, uh, constitutional, I think. So unless and until we have that, uh, the, the government didn't do anything with the court striking down this, but it, you can't really tell if it's if it didn't do it because they wanted to kind of uh, accept it and, and move uh, in other ways, or because of the war. But now it's not really the time to start this thing over again. 
Uh, but right now, yeah, the court is the only uh, only solution to those uh, cases. Thanks, Michal. That's really interesting. Um, I'm not a legal scholar, so my question is not going to be um, purely kind of. Uh, but I want to pick up on David's question to you about um, the potential um, role that um, the court can play in, um, back to your Swiss example, making society ready um, to make the link between, particularly, the occupation and democracy. I want to kind of uh, just share a small anecdote in those, those, this context, because I've, 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 every time I've been going to Israel, on Israeli originally, I've been taking part in these protests, and late August, very early before October 7th, it, it seems to me, and maybe you know, it's my own kind of hopeful, I uh, join with you the hope, um, for the first time, it seemed that in the demonstration, there was a lot of visibility to the occupation um, question, so there were these huge, amazing, innovative placards that, you know what's unreasonable? The occupation. Um, or the occupation kills democracy. So there seemed, and the speeches in Kaplan and Tel Aviv started making the link at the level of you know, the street between the question of we can't have really a democracy so long as the occupation is going on. Um, and I seemed, I, had, I was really ecstatic about, here it is, the society starts maybe to be ready. Um, but it seems that we're now back, you know, uh, under the current also trauma and the conflict. I just wonder whether you think the court does have a role to push society, or whether it is about waiting for society to be ready um, for particularly this, you know, making the whole idea of if you are pro-democracy, and that's the name of these protests. How can we be pro-democracy so long as we are occupying another people? So I think that, in general, the court does have a role to uh, not to make society ready. I think this is too big for the courts <laughs> to do, but to push in or to show uh, um, a direction or to show uh, where the human rights go. Um, I had a decision uh, on closing down uh, strip clubs in Israel. I mean, in Mount Gan, but it went, then they closed it all over. And there were people saying, but it's not the role of, uh, of the courts, and those women want to work in uh, um, strip clubs, and you should let them. And I said, no, uh, a democratic society don't use women as objects, and you don't do that. And it was a, in planning law, actually, <coughs> if, it's a, if it's a place of entertainment. That was the, said making women objects is not entertainment. So uh, it took five, four years. Then Tel Aviv closed all the, shut them down, and then the Attorney General issued a, a kind of a rule that saying that uh, lap dance is prostitution, so, and then they closed everything. So you can do it, but, um, but it's, it's very, um, it's, it's in, in very small steps. And the far the society is from the solution, the harder it is. So if it's really far away, I think the courts can do less. If, if it's more ongoing, it's easier. And I think that in the subject of the occupation, since um, it's also not internal law, but international law, it's even more difficult because it's not the, the court's role at all. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's much more difficult. It's almost like a rhetorical question, so to follow up. Uh, the ability, of course, to do what, what Shannon's describing is, is becomes more and more difficult when you're subject to continue attacks by politicians. Right? You, might, you, might, you might claim that you remain independent and as active as you were before, but the reality is that mm -hmm. you know, under attack, you're less likely to do it. 
I'm curious about uh, the your comments that Israel doesn't have a constitution because of um, the wartime founding of the state. Um, and of course, Israel has been in the state for a few decades. Um, and I'm curious if the, that discussion ever uh, was brought up again about forming the constitution. Um, uh, and you mentioned then in the recent decision that that was something that the Supreme Court said needs to happen. Um, and if maybe the discussion hasn't been made or, or movements haven't been made to form that, if there's a, a reason for that, if there's this understanding that by not having a constitution, um, you know, the government um, was not bound in certain ways, um, or if this was an ongoing tension within, within Israeli society? Yes, as you said, the, mainly the government didn't want it because, you know, it's much more complicated when you have a, a constitution. Uh, but not only that, the one of the reasons that it's not only the war, it was war, but you know, since then a lot of years passed. But there are some very basic tensions in the Israeli society, um, not between um, not um, between the Arabs and Jews, but between the secular and orthodox. And the main problem was equality. And equality wasn't, isn't in our human rights bill. It isn't there. It's very uh, partial because of that. Because uh, they couldn't agree on equality. So this was, and this was going on years, and uh, there were a lot of suggestion, and there was uh, a movement called Constitution by, um, They tried to to uh, form a, con um, uh, a constitution model by talk by having talks with all uh, parts of society. Uh, constitution by consent, they called it. Mm -hmm. And and we have a draft, but it never moved forward because of those basic tensions. And right now. Uh, they are trying, uh, they have it in the coalition uh, agreements, to pass on a law regarding the duty of the orthodox religious to serve in the army. And right now, because of the war, they can't pass it because people are really fighting. And, 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 but it comes up again and again and again. So that's the reason the courts are keeping uh, calling for, for this, it's not the first time. But that's, I think, the major thing that because of that, we can go forward. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> my question is a bit like broader than only the legal um, constitutional aspects um, at stakes in Israel. It's also about like the political like dynamics uh, that still exist. Um, I wanted to ask you like if, according to you, um, the current parliamentary regime, uh, which still exists since, uh, if, I, if I'm right, since the creation of Israel. Um, so if the current parliamentary regime, uh, which is in place, uh, with all its instability and shortcomings, and from which uh, follows uh, the necessity for like a um, new elected prime minister um, to form coalitions and to compose with um, different kind of uh, politicians like leaders uh, from um, far right leaders to orthodox, um, which are who are really, um, definitely opposed to more uh, secularism uh, policies, um, is that kind of um, governmental um, necessity, like um, which um, which comes from that parliamentary regime, uh, is it according to you? Uh, a barrier like uh, in the Knesset for more um, for new developments toward more democracy uh, and peace um, because to that regard yeah um, like the, the the prime ministers are, the, are a bit bound and have to find difficult compromise with very opposite visions of uh, so I will not talk about the current government because I can't but I'll tell you that there were um, um, they tried to change the system. There were 
had one election that was a direct election for the prime minister. They changed the law. They wanted to create something similar to the United States. So you have um, only two um, candidates. and um, Well, it didn't work. Uh, and they changed it again. It didn't change anything. It didn't work in that sense. Not that the people who were elected or it didn't work since, again, uh, uh, there was a direct, uh, the, the prime minister was elected directly, but then he had the, the parties and, and we were in the same uh, place again. And there are suggestions now and in the last years saying we should change the system, uh, having uh, um, um, elections that par are partially like in England by zones, but not not a direct, uh, not all member of the Knesset will be um, elected as a whole, but part of them will be uh, elected by zones. And this should, people believe or think, that this should uh, change th things. Uh, before the war and before the last election, there were like four or five elections in a row. Uh, that weren't decided, actually. And also, this last election, although the coalition has 64 uh, members of Knesset, but it was uh, kind of because one party didn't uh, get in. And it, again, the, if, you, if, you, if you check the polls before the war now, it all changed. Um, <coughs> it's half and half. So. If the people are half and half, then you know that's the that's the problem. Oh, not the problem. That's the situation. So, um, so there are uh, suggestions, but uh, right now I I don't think uh, they'll go anywhere. <coughs> okay, I haven't seen any of the hands up, so I'm going to steal the last question. I'm not looking at it, guess it's so, you know, political realists often talk about how international law is just not really relevant. It doesn't make any difference. It's just a waste of time. Um, and yet, in our conversation tonight, you see that that's patently not true. International law defines whether, some, whether uh, the West Bank is occupied, annexed, and therefore affects whether or not rights can be recognized in the West Bank. And, and we often talk about other ways in which international law can have effects, even though there isn't a world policeman, even though it can't be enforced. And so, I want to end tonight with a question of, of obviously, that, that is a huge question, and we can't possibly do justice to it, but it's about, about the recent ICJ uh, case uh, on uh, the action brought by South Africa in relation to the claims of genocide in, in Gaza. Um, now, so this is a, this is a provisional measures judgment, okay? It's a, it's, a, it's a plausibility standard, so it's a very low legal standard to be able to get to provisional measures. This is not a, a decision, and people need to understand that decision is many years away, and, and, and the arguments on both sides are extremely complex, we can't possibly litigate them here. But I guess just one final question, in terms of the effects that international law can have upon moving towards resolution of conflict and towards controlling action, I just wonder whether you could say a little bit about the effect that the actual action itself, not the merits, but the actual action itself has had within Israel, right? Remembering, of course, that the, that the Convention of Genocide was introduced to address the, the, the atrocities of the Holocaust. Um, what do you think it's had any effects in terms of how people think about how Israel seen, what we should do, how people speak as politicians, how they shouldn't speak, actions on the ground in terms of what uh, steps have been taken by the military? Has it, what sort of effect has it had? How has it uh, I think it's too early to say. Uh, but I want to take you to another court to the ICC, because I think the ICC, as, a, as an idea, maybe even, has an effect uh, even on, on, on the judicial reform. Because um, in international, and I'm not an international lawyer or judge, but there is a complementary principle um, that relates to the International Criminal Court, and 
It refers to the idea that the ICC will only intervene when national assist law enforcement systems are unable or unwilling uh, to persecute individuals for international crimes, such as crimes against humanity or war crimes. And up till now, uh, the understanding was that Israel has um, independent law enforcement and judiciary. So the ICC will not um, step in. Uh, part of the uh, arguments against the judicial reform were that if, um, and I'm going back to making the Attorney General political and, uh, and limiting the court's power. Uh, so the arguments went that if this will happen, that Israel will not have this, uh, will not enjoy this uh, uh, complementary principle anymore, and the ICC can move forward and can uh, bring to justice any uh, personal, uh, any person in Israel who served in the army, for example. So it does have an effect, but I think about the South African case, it's a little bit too early. Michal, we are out of time. We've actually gone a little over time. So I just want to thank you so much tonight for coming uh, to talking to us all. It's been a, a, a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you.